Hey, Doug. Hey, Mo. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Welcome to Smart Training 365. This is Mo Larby. Uh, Doug, today we're going to talk about something that I watched yesterday by chance. Um, I was uh, like surfing on the net and uh, looking for a YouTube video for a, a different video that we will be talking about later. And I found out a video about Dave Palombo and uh, the priest. I don't know if you watched the video, but let me play it for you. All right. Uh, somebody's asking about Dave. You're going to respond to Doug Brignoli putting you straight on your only formed opinions. Ah, Doug Brignoli. How old is Doug Brignoli, Brignoli these days? He's been copy and pasting that for like the last yeah. two shows. What does he want? Is the question? Oh, yeah. He says you're ill informed on your opinions on biomechanics. <laughs> Look, all I know is when I squatted 600 pounds, I got 33-inch quads from doing it. So something worked, obviously. So, But have you ever noticed the ones who put you down, it's like you've been there, you've done it, you've done it and it's worked. It's always these people who really don't have any muscle mass who know, like, they can tell you how to get it. They know the ins and outs of how to build muscle, right. how to do they this. Like, then, why, then why haven't you done it? Right. If you're such an expert, it obviously didn't work for you, did it, you dickhead? It'd be like me trying to teach someone how to swim. I'm not a good swimmer. I can swim, but it'd be like me being – and the Olympic swimming coach is Lee Priest. Hi. Right. <laughs> <laughs> kick, kick. I'd be like, I haven't got a clue. You don't know how to swim, Lee? Yeah, I don't know how to swim, but I'm not a great swimmer. So it'd be like me coaching swimming. They'd be like, what's this Lee know about swimming? Nothing. <laughs> but I can swim, but, you know, like like Doug, Doug Brignoli. Okay, he can lift weights and he had abs and shit, didn't he? But it's like, well, what do you know about, you're not a mass monster, so well, how are you going to tell someone The difference is if Doug Brignoli even did, he had a good physique when he was younger, but he didn't He didn't build his physique using the techniques he's using now. So, I mean, it, it, I know. Well, it, you know, when you say he was younger. If you have injuries, some of the stuff he says makes sense. But all I'm saying, if people had to ask me a question, do I think building big legs, you're going to build big legs doing sissy squats? And I said, no, you got to squat. You know, obviously it worked for a lot of people. <laughs> you know, so you don't, yeah, like, you don't try to like, reinvent the wheel. Okay. If, the, if you don't, need I don't, to. I don't think, I don't think yet, Dave, I know bodybuilding has been going a long time yeah. you know, from the sixties, fifties and Tom Platts and Arnold and oh, Mensa. I know it's been going for a lot of people have been squatting for a while, but I don't think the evidence is in yet on squats if they build legs. Maybe give it another couple of years before we can actually put a, you know, dot this, cross this T and dot this I on if yeah, squats yeah. work. Maybe a couple more years, we need proof. That's right. You don't go jumping the gun yet, Dave, all right? It's like, yeah, but, you know, sissy squats will give you a nice shape. Because I think, um, well, look, Vince Garonda, there's one guy, he never had a squat rack in his gym, didn't believe in squats. And he had people do, like, some sort of hack squat version and sissy squats and that. Right. And the guys he had trained had nice shaped legs. They had like nice muscle shape on them, but they didn't have those huge freaky legs. So right. there is something to be said that, you know, squats and those heavy compound right. movements will, will give you more mass and that development. It's like, it's not rocket science, is it? Because look at us. Oh, look at me. I'm yeah. no fucking rocket science. Lee. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> question <for> <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad he admitted it. Uh, <laughs> okay. First of all, um, let me just say that, that the person who was making that comment, uh, Lee Priest apparently said, Doug Brignoli says, you are misinformed on biomechanics. That is never what I said. I never said Dave Palumbo is misinformed on biomechanics. That's never what I said. All I said is that you can load your quadriceps more with sissy squats than you can with barbell squats, even using lesser weight, right? That's all I said. I never said anything about Dave Palumbo. I never criticized anyone. Lee Priest was saying, why is it these people that put you down? It's like, I've never put anybody down. I've never put anybody down. I've never said to anything that sounds like this person is ill-informed, this person is dumb, this person is, I've never said, I would never say that. That's just not who I am, number one. Number two is the analysis that, or the analogy that Lee Priest is using about, what do I know about swimming? I wouldn't be a swim coach. That is completely different. And the reason it's completely different is because whether or not I was a mass monster or not, I was trying to grow muscle, whether I was using traditional exercises or not. And the goal of muscle building is to load muscle. And I hope we can all agree 
that the more you load a muscle, the more that muscle grows. So the objective is, how do we get more load on the muscle? And when you understand a little bit about physics, you can see that a, a limb or a lever that is angled at 30 degrees, like the lower leg is when you squat, is going to load the quadricep with less percentage of load you're using as compared to allowing that lower leg to get more horizontal. So um, I'm actually in the process of, of creating a, a, a balance scale right now that has a one foot lever on each side. Um, that would be, you know, it's obviously the lower leg is longer than a, than a, than a foot, but the point is that the, the, on this side of the scale, it's gonna be horizontal. On this side of the scale, it's gonna be a 30 degree angle. So they're both gonna be the same length. I'm gonna put a little basket on the end of each lever and I'm gonna get some weights and I'm gonna show that how much more load you have to put in this basket over here with the 30 degree angle limb versus this mm -hmm. lever over here with the horizontal limb to show we're talking about load. And in fact, you know, we've done the math on this. When you, if you weigh a, a 200, if you weigh 200 pounds and you've got 200 pounds on your back and you can do the calculation on this, a 30 pound degree forward tilt to the tibia will load each of your quadriceps with about 925 pounds of load. That might seem like a lot, but what you don't realize is when you're doing a sissy squat, if you weigh 200 pounds and you allow your lower leg to get almost fully horizontal, you will load each of your quadriceps with about 1,200 pounds of load. That's load, that's straight load. That, there's no equivocating here. More load equals more stimulation to the muscle to grow. Period. Now, obviously, watching a person do a bodyweight sissy squat is not nearly as impressive as watching a guy with 200 pounds on his back. But if you don't know physics, you will naturally think that the guy who's got the 200 pounds, he's certainly working harder, right? I mean, he's getting more overall stress on his bones and more overall, you know, <laughs> because he's wasting a lot of effort. A lot of that effort is being wasted because it's not being percentage wise, it's not being loaded onto the target muscles. Now, I will agree that when you do a squat, a barbell squat, you are also loading your erector spinae, which is the muscle that runs all the way up your back, as well as the gluteus and the other hip extensors, which are the hamstrings and the adductors. And you do not do any of that with a sissy squat. It's 100% quadricep. Um, but I can also show you mathematically, just like I did on the sissy squat versus the barbell squat, how you can load each of the hip extensors, the glutes, the adductors, the hamstrings, more, better, again, using less weight without putting anything on your spine by using a multi-hip machine. And if you separate those two things and you say, well, I've got more load on, on the hip extensors doing this than I do on a squat. I've got more load on the sissy squat doing it this way than a squat. These are the muscles that I want to grow. They're more loaded. Logically, they're supposed to, they're going to grow more. They have to, There's, they have no choice. Now, the other argument that's being made sometimes is, um, and Lee Priest, you know, alludes to it, you know, jokingly, he says, you know, um, we don't know yet if, 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 if barbell squats actually work, right? And, 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 and you know, uh, Dave Palumbo says, look, all I know is that when I squatted 600 pounds, I had 33 inch, 33 inch legs, thighs. And I, I would say, okay, well, thank you for admitting that is all you know. Right. In other words, you don't know if there are other ways to do it. You know that way worked. Right. But yeah. logically, there can't be yet people. I mean, you know, conventional weight training has been around, you know, 100 years. And this is, you know, only in the last couple of years has this physics approach really come to light. There hasn't been enough time yet for people to actually try doing it this way to say that system doesn't work. So you... <laughs> Look, once upon a time, there was no such thing as jet airplanes. All airplanes were flown with propellers. People couldn't have imagined a jet. They would have said, why reinvent the wheel? We already know how airplanes fly. True. Right? All of a sudden, someone invents the jet. Someone realizes there's a more efficient way to fly, just like there's a more efficient way to train. So... The bottom line is that now international flights are never with propeller. International flights, long distance 
flights, yes, propellers still exist, just like conventional weight training will always exist. But there is a better way. There is, and it's, and it's absolute. It's not an opinion and it's not, you know, this is, I mean, if we can agree on just the simple logic that more load on a muscle makes a muscle grow, if, that, if we can't agree on that, then you would never increase weight on the weight you're using, right? I mean, the, we, the reason we increase the weight on anything because we, we sense, we know that when we load a muscle more, it's more apt to grow. The question is, is there efficient, a more efficient way to do it? And the answer is yes. You know, Doug, uh, based on what he said last time, and he said, you can prove that scientifically, you can prove it on paper, but um, it might be, you might be right. You might be right saying that. But uh, as he said, and he was serious about that, like from the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, people were doing the squat and these big, uh, big lifts. And the proof is in the results. Like, let's say, look at all the Mr. Uh, Olympia, the bodybuilders. They did all these big lifts. They have big uh, thighs. They are huge. And they didn't do the brick 20 movement. But he, he, he forgot to say one thing. He didn't mention anything about uh, steroids. You know, that's something that we cannot ignore. Like, okay, we can try to, but it, he pushed us to say this. Like, nobody, if you take the steroid out, what can you do besides the great genetics that you have that will get you great results? What will you choose? Will you choose uh, uh, efficient exercises or inefficient exercises? Obviously, the more efficient exercise. Yeah. He will be looking well, for which one loads the muscle more. Right. Well, he, here's the other thing, though, too. Um, and it kind of goes along with the steroid thing. In other words, there is a type of person that is very, very, very ambitious, that wants to get as big as they can possibly get. And part of that attitude, part of that mindset is taking steroids. But the other part of that mindset is... Um, the, uh, the, the sort of the general, the broad idea of working as hard as you can. Yeah. And so when people squat as hard as they can with that mindset, um, they, are, they are putting in more effort than a person who doesn't have that mindset. And so you're not actually comparing apples with apples. Yeah. In other words, what I'm saying is this. <clears throat> and part of this has to do with um, sort of, I guess you could say, the, the, the ease with which you can do a sissy squat similarly to a barbell squat. And by that, I mean everyone can do a bodyweight squat. Everyone can add 50 pounds. Everyone can add 100, 150, 200, 250. Everyone can make these gradual inclines. Now, if you say, well, can I do the same thing with a sissy squat? Well, now it gets a little harder, right? Because you can't balance a barbell on your back the way you can in a barbell squat. And so what ends up happening is you end up doing a body weight squat and, and you may not be able to balance yourself as well as a person could on a regular squat. And so what, what ends up happening is you end up getting a person who does body weight sissy squats for 20 reps versus a guy who does barbell squats for five or six reps. Right. And so you realize, well, this guy here is in a mindset. Right. And I talk about this in my book is that people have favored compound movements over isolation exercises because they have believed that compound exercises are the mass builders and that isolation exercises are the shapers. Mm -hmm. So they haven't invested the same amount of energy in the isolation exercises. Right. They sort of like treat them as incidental. So. Um, if you don't invest the same amount of effort, the same amount of intensity on an isolation exercise because you just think it's sort of a throwaway shaper, but you invest some serious focus on this heavier lift, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're going to get, by default, more growth of the compound because you're doing more sets of it. You're using heavier weight with it. You're more, you know, committed to it, right? So the point I'm making is if you committed yourself equally to the right isolation exercise. If you did the same kind of, you know, you see a guy psyching up for a squat, yeah. you know, you know, what if you did that 
to psych up for a sissy squat because you're using enough weight that limits you to six reps. Now you're comparing apples with apples. Body weight, 20 reps. Okay, yeah, naturally, that you're not going to get as much stimulation, right? The best way to do the sissy squat is with cables, bar none. Otherwise, you're just using body weight, you're using elastic bands, you're using a vest, maybe using dumbbells. Look, I did sissy squat, cable sissy squats last night. I guarantee you a Smith, I mean, a, a free motion machine or any one of these machines, you know, can provide you plenty of resistance. I, I think we used, we used, um, I'd have to look at, at, at the stack again, but it was, it was somewhere in the vicinity of 50 or 60 pounds on each side. So 100, 120 pounds um, for sets of 10. And I'm still not you know, like really pushing it, but it, you can obviously do the same incremental increases with a cable sissy squat than you can with a barbell on a barbell squat. That's how you do it. That's how you really, really push the envelope with a sissy squat. If you're going to just think of a sissy squat as a body weight thing, it'll never, it'll never compare to any exercise. I don't want to say barbell squat, but any exercise in which you can actually keep incrementally adding and adding and adding and pushing the limits and, and, and limiting yourself to the heaviest possible six reps. That is what causes muscle growth. And you can do that with a cable sissy squat. And it is amazing. I mean, the, it is insane the way your quads, I mean, look, I challenge anyone. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, if I had the ability to, you know, let's say, hang out with these people, I don't have the ability to hang out with everybody, of course. But I, if somebody was standing next to me and I said, okay, let's go, we're going to do these sissy squats, we're going to do tens of these mothers, and we're going to do them as heavy as we can. <laughs> we're going to work up, right? I guarantee you won't be able to walk the next day, right? And then you do the same thing for the glutes and the hip extensors, right? And then you end up with just as much, if not more, quadricep and gluteus load without any spinal compression whatsoever. It's, it's just, you have to know how to do it. You can't compare apples and oranges. Again, uh, he referred to your system, you know, uh, for people who maybe were injured, that's, that will work for them. So why he believes that it can be used for people who are injured? Why it can't be used before you get injured, for example? Right. Well, not only it can be used before you get injured, but, but the other thing also, look, I think, I think Dave Palumbo um, understands that um, logically and mathematically, this makes sense. I, I, I get the sense that he understands that, which is why, you know, he's not going to shoot it down the way Lee Priest was. You know, obviously, Dave Palumbo has a little bit more um, analytical tendency. Lee Priest is sort of just, uh, you know, well, <laughs> well, look at him, right? You know that he, the kind of, kind of personality, the kind of mindset that he has, right? Yeah. He says, you know, basically the proof is in the pudding. You know, if you get big doing this, you know, you just shoot a lot of steroids, pump a lot of weight, you get big. It's like, well, all right, that's not very bright, but okay. I'm not going to say it hasn't worked. It has worked, but that is not necessarily the best way. Um, but what I want to say is this, is that, you know, um, when you are, when you have spent years and years and years doing something a particular way, that has become, whether you realize it or not, part of your identity, part of your mantra, part of who you are, right? Uh, it is difficult. It is difficult to wrap your head around um, the fact that maybe you could have done it a better way. So there's a little bit of a resistance, sometimes a lot of a resistance to sort of acknowledging, wow, how could I not have realized that, you know? So I think Dave is just basically sticking to the emotional attachment um, and just the wanting to believe that we've already proven it. I've already proven it. It doesn't need a different way of doing it. Well, it may not need it, but there is one and it does work better. And you don't have to wait until you're injured. And if you, if you treat this better physics method with the same intensity and the same focus and the same mindset that you, you do the other, then you're going to get as good a result without the wear and tear on the body. It's, it's just a fact. But let's face it, who, how many of us have ever seen anybody doing a sissy squat with the same intensity that they do a barbell squat? 
in part because they don't know they can do it with cables, right? They almost always do it with just body weight. Um, but but they just don't treat it that way because they think of it as a shaping exercise. You don't think of it. But a muscle doesn't know the difference, by the way. If a muscle is loaded, it's loaded. It doesn't have any way of knowing what you're actually doing. It only knows how, how, how it's being challenged to perform its function, right? So if I'm a quadricep and I'm trying to extend that knee, I'm going to, all I know is I'm going to feel a certain amount of resistance or a certain amount of challenge to me being able to extend this knee. The greater that challenge is, the more I'm going to be forced to grow. That's all it knows. It's not going to say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, there isn't any gluteus working here. There's, there, is no, there is no spinal compression going here. Oh, this must be a shaper. No, there's no way the, the muscle could probably, could, could possibly discern between whether the spine is being compressed, whether the glutes are being involved. And by the way, none of this, we haven't talked anything yet. This is just strictly physics so far. We haven't talked about the fact that when you do a squat and you activate the hip extension muscles, you deactivate the hip flexion muscles, one of which is the rectus femoris, which is about 20% of the quadricep, right? So, and this has been documented in EMG studies. Yeah. You've actually connected an EMG electrode onto that rectus femoris and found almost no activation of 20% of your quadricep when you're squatting because of the reciprocal inhibition that's caused by the activation of the hip extensors. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, even that alone would make an isolation quadricep exercise better because you don't have any deactivation of the rectus femoris. Mm -hmm. How many people, I mean, what would, I will say leg extension. We do see people going very heavy on leg extension and doing it for sets of six. And that's great. That's a mass builder. There's no doubt that's a mass builder. Right. But, you know, if, if you think that that squats are superior to leg extensions then why do leg extensions at all, that's an isolation exercise. If you think leg extensions is a good exercise, you have to think sissy squats is a good exercise, too, because they're the same thing. They're both isolated quadricep knee extension exercises. Yeah. So just treat the leg, the sissy squat the same way you would heavy leg extensions. He said, well, if you know how to do it, why didn't you do it yourself? <laughs> Um, look, Frank, uh, Dave Palumbo was right in the sense that we all started with whatever the conventional wisdom was at the time, right? When I started at the age of 14, um, the little home barbell set that I got came with a little booklet, you know, and it, and it had bench press, it had squats, it had incline press, it had, you know, the, the conventional exercises. Um, again, I've, I've said this time and time again, these exercises do work. They don't work better than other things necessarily, but they work, right? So it's, it's this whole analogy of, like I've said before, if you drive to a location and the road you take is really rough um, and you arrive at your location um, with your vehicle all beat up, um, you can't logically assume that the road you took was the best road to take just because you arrived. That can't be the only criteria you use to determine whether the route you took was the best route. Now, that's a simple analogy, of course, but, it, but it's extremely like what we're talking about. We're talking about taking a route that doesn't require as much abuse on the body, but actually gets you to your destination more easily. Surgeries. Same amount of load or more without the wear and tear. Yeah, to avoid surgeries. and. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Well, not only to avoid surgeries, but I mean, look, if you're buying a piece of property, why pay more for it than you have to, yeah. <laughs> right? If you want a reward of some sort, if you want a thing and it's going to require a cost, logically, you should want to figure out how you can invest the least amount of cost. Now, when I say the least amount of cost, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying let's take the lazy man's way. I'm not saying, you know, um, don't train as hard as you possibly can. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't, unnecessarily waste energy don't use 300 pounds to get 30 percent of that to go to the muscle to get 90 pounds of resistance when you can use 100 pounds and 90 percent of it going to 90 pounds of resistance to the muscle either way it's 90 pounds of, res of resistance to the muscle but your skeleton will thank you for using only 100 pounds versus 300 pounds yeah. doug are you trying to reinvent the wheel <laughs> again I, I as i said before i am not 
I'm not suggesting that I have a better way to build muscle and it doesn't involve muscle load. I'm not saying that. That would be reinventing the wheel. I'm saying muscle load works. There's a better mm -hmm. way to get muscle load. There's a, a mathematically better way, a physics way, uh, an avoidance of neurological interference way of getting better, more muscle load. Muscle load is the wheel. That's the wheel. I'm not trying to say, let's try to figure out a way to make muscles grow without load. That would be, you know, uh, what's that, um, you know, the oil, I uh, can't think of the name of it, you know, coming up with some way to inflate the muscle without actually making it grow by way of loading it. That would be reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. The wheel is loading the muscle. It's almost like saying, okay, here's the wheel. Let's figure out a way to put a tire on it instead of just having it be a wood wheel. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that make it smoother? Let's put ball bearings in there so that there's not so much friction that it wears out. Still, it's a wheel. I like, I like this uh, example. These, these are simply more efficient ways of doing what you want to do, which is making the wheel go round and round. I'm thinking there is a better way. Our program teaches there is a better way to load the muscle as much or more. We're not changing courses here. All we're doing is eliminating the wasted effort. Right. You are going to find many objections, many um, people who will be saying that, uh, no, that's not true. It's only theoretical and stuff. And um, having reactions like this, I think uh, it's uh, necessary for us to show people why, for example, uh, that squat is not the, the right way. The more we answer questions like this, the more people will take the time to maybe get the book or um, invest more time to understand the Brignoli method. It's not just, you know, uh, something we're saying. Right, but, but I, I, wanna, I wanna clear something up that you said, and this is where we have to be careful. You said um, that squats is not the right way. We, we cannot say that. No, this okay. is exactly what, I mean, I'm glad you said it because, because it gives us the opportunity to, to explain, again, that we are not saying that squats don't build muscle. If you want to squat, you can go ahead and squat and you will get muscle gain from it. It'll be more costly. It'll be more risky. It'll require more effort than is actually necessary. All we're saying is it's not the best way. If you define best as more loading with less resistance mm -hmm. and less wear and tear in the body. I mean, we have to make the assumption that you're on the same page as us as the definition of best. Best means as much or more muscle load with less wear and tear in the body and less effort wasted. If you agree with that, then... All we're saying is just try these exercises because <laughs> you'll be surprised at how efficient they are, how, how much, especially if you have a sense of having done it the other way before, you'll say, yeah, I do feel more muscle load. I mean, we've got, there was a guy, you might've seen it on Facebook that said, I'm 75 years old. Yes. I've been using your methods now for the last two years. I've put an inch on my arm at 75 years old using exercises that are not compound exercises, using these break 20 exercises, uh, the ones that are the most efficient. So uh, yes, I mean, muscle load is muscle load. That's a must. I'm not debating that. I'm just debating how we get more most muscle load. Well, thank you, Doug, for uh, being open-minded. Some people say, <laughs> wow, Doug is so chill, man. Like they watched the first video, you know, the rebuttal about yeah. Dave Palumbo. And he said, like, how he can stay quiet and just explain it. So you did it again now, too. Well, but, <laughs> but let me just say that it would be foolish for me to get upset. I mean, uh, first of all, it's understandable that the conventional wisdom is ingrained in a lot of people's minds. It's understandable. Um, I mean, it's understandable that a person who has taught conventional methods would feel a little bit 
I don't know, guilty, I guess, or maybe embarrassed or maybe a little bit uneasy um, thinking that, you know, he maybe should have known better. I'm, I'm, I'm always saying, no, you sh- I'm not saying you should have known better. I mean, this is, this is true, by the way, in a lot of other industries where, you know, it, it, it took years and years and years before people figure, by the way, let me also just say, you know, once upon a time, we, you know, the, the population, humans didn't know what plate tectonics were. Right. We didn't know what caused earthquakes. We didn't know that continents drifted. We didn't know any of that stuff. And the person who discovered it was not a geologist. And it upset a lot of geologists mm-hmm. because they felt like they should have been the ones who discovered it or they should have said, what does this guy know? He's not even a geologist. Right. We're the geologists. We're the ones who know we're the size monsters. We're the ones who know, <laughs> right? Size monsters, <laughs> right? Um, and and guess what? It is now accepted science. Plate tectonics is accepted science, right? I'll give you another example. Once upon a time, no one knew what made the dinosaurs go extinct. And and the father and son team who discovered that it was a massive meteor that hit the Earth and created this huge cloud that basically changed the climate of the entire planet. Again, they were not geologists. They first discovered sediment differences in layers. And they realized that some event had happened. And and so they started searching for what might be considered a large enough crater. And of course, now they've discovered it's in Chicxulub, Mexico. It's massive, massive subterranean crater where the meteor actually hit and where that event happened that had global catastrophic effects. Again, these were not geologists, mm-hmm. and yet the geologists were upset. What do you know? It's preposterous. I mean, there were lots of times in history that people have, ha- have, were forced to change their thinking because a discovery was made that completely reinterpreted the science that they thought they already knew. This is just one more of those events. It's you it, look, I mean, I, when I make my scale, you simply cannot argue with physics and physics proves it. I mean, when we do this, I make the scale, I'll show you a 30 degree angle lever that's equally long to a horizontal lever will require a whole lot more weight to balance out with less weight of a horizontal and this is what happens to the quadricep. It's absolutely quantifiable and provable. It's not an opinion. Now, again, as I said before, if you want to believe that something else makes quadriceps grow, like spinal compression, and that's why squats works better, okay, fine, you can believe that. But if you agree with the simple logic that more muscle load means more muscle growth, this is undeniable science. If you agree or disagree with what Doug just said, let us know in the comment section. Thank you very much, Doug, and I will see you in the next video. Sounds great. Thanks, Mo.